This week on Quality Digest Live, we examine an epidemic of empathy fatigue among healthcare workers. Plus, how managers can hold employees accountable without cracking the whip. That more when we come back. TrackWise by Sparta Systems enables quality, manufacturing, and regulatory affairs professionals to streamline processes, consolidate redundant systems, and reduce manual operations for increased revenue. Visit SpartaSystems.com. Welcome back to Quality Digest Live for December 16th, 2011. QDL is your weekly look at who and what is making the news in the world of quality. I'm Mike Richmond, publisher of Quality Digest. And I'm Quality Digest Editor-in-Chief, Dirk Ducharme. In the news this week, NIST has announced it is accepting proposals for funding a broad range of potential research projects that support the Institute's measurement science and engineering programs. Among the nine measurement science and engineering grants are those for the Material Measurement Lab Grant Program and the Physical Measurement Lab Grant Program. I mentioned those two because those are the two that are probably most relevant for our audience. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, the Material Measurement Lab uh, grant covers fields such as chemistry and biochemistry, ceramics, metallurgy, polymer science, surface science, and other related material science projects. Mm -hmm. uh, the Physical Measurement Lab grant covers basic physical measurement and classic weights and measures. So during the fiscal year of 2011, the combined MSC grant program has funded a total of 86 projects, uh, totaling about 15 $15.6 million. Mm -hmm. uh, the funding generally goes to support scientific or engineering research, can be used in other ways, conferences and so forth. Uh, for more information on the submission guidelines and deadlines, visit the link in our story, which is right beneath the player. In the story itself, there is a link to the grant programs. Great. Thanks, Dirk. Also in the news this week, something that's near and dear to my heart, how exceptional service leads to greater sales. But what does it say about quality? Accenture, a global management consulting firm, recently announced the results from a survey of 1,000 U.S. consumers. The subject was the effect that post-sale service and support plays in influencing forthcoming buying decisions for products such as automobiles, home appliances, and consumer electronics. Now, on the one hand, the results were not very surprising. 26% of those surveyed indicated that service and support were the most important factors driving purchasing decisions. Fair enough. Sure. However, just 13% of respondents said that the quality of the product itself was the most important factor in their purchase. So, in other words, twice as many people found service rather than quality to be the greatest influence in choosing which product to buy. In a way, in a way that kind of sounds that the products are kind of awash, so they're being judged based on... Service. service. Well, right, okay. I, I personally, I found that to be much sure. of a surprise, really, that for so many consumers, as you say, the prompt and efficient service to repair the expected problems is more important than the inherent quality of the product itself. <laughs> so <laughs> funny. Th this, this perception, and I don't know that it's necessarily a correct perception, but this perception among U.S. consumers of poor quality in the products coming out of these, these very important manufacturing sectors is one of which all of us in the industry certainly need to be aware. So for more details on the survey, please click again below the link. Uh, pl please click uh, again below the player for the link on the story. Okay, our next story is near and dear to my heart. Um, this story is called Researcher Takes on Empathy Fatigue in the Workplace. Uh, this came from UC Berkeley News Center. And the kicker here is distancing and dehumanizing behavior actually compounds the problem of empathy fatigue. Now, the reason this is interesting to me, this has to do with healthcare workers. They are a <clears throat> a special type of customer service representative. They don't think of themselves that way, but, but they are. They're the frontline customer meets the road for the healthcare industry. Sure. And my wife is a nurse, so I have a particular, uh, particular knowledge in, into, into some of this. Um, what this article deals with is that, particularly for healthcare workers, um, they're working in a stressful environment. You're dealing with, uh, you're dealing with people who are physically ill. They're emotionally distraught. Uh, sometimes there's psychological problems. And you know, as a nurse and dealing with this day in and day out, it can be very stressful. And they start to uh, be, get, get on the job kind of stress uh, fatigue and job burnout. And one of the ways of coping with this for many of them is to start to distance themselves emotionally from their patients. And uh, kind of we, we, they refer to it in this article as empathy fatigue. So they start to, rather than to um, 
uh, become a kind of a emotionally integrated with, with their parent, uh, with their patient, and understand them and, and try to see where they're coming from emotionally, they start to back off. Which makes perfect sense. Sure, they see it as a way of protecting themselves because they're getting, they're getting overwhelmed. Sure. The problem is that, well, there's two problems. One is, from a patient care perspective, not good. Because one of the things that patients look for is not just somebody to come in and fix the meat. It's to fix the, it's to fix, it's to help emotionally in, in the support. So when, it, when a nurse starts to detach themselves, it's not good for the patient. The interesting thing though, that's kind of common sense. The interesting thing the study is finding, uh, the study is being done by, by the way, by uh, a doctoral student, uh, Eve Ekman. Eve Ekman. Mm -hmm. um, what she's finding is that it doesn't help the nurse either. This emotional distancing actually compounds their stress problem and for kind of a common sense reason. And she has a great quote here. I'm going to go to my, uh, go to my slide here. About empathy fatigue, uh, Eve Ekman says, chronic stress can lead to a sense of helplessness that can cause people to withdraw emotionally from their work in order to protect themselves. But dehumanization leads to a lack of work fulfillment that can prevent people from doing their jobs it's a, well. It's a feedback loop. It, it, yeah, it's exactly. It's a, it's a feedback loop and it causes this vicious cycle where I'm stressed, so I'm going to kind of pull, pull back, back from my patient, but now I'm not feeling fulfilled because part of my reason to be a nurse or a healthcare worker is to, work with people. Is to have this yeah, connection. Sure. And so now I'm, I'm less fulfilled, so now I'm more stressed and it's just a spiral. It doesn't work. So what her study and the direction she's going with, with her study on this empathy fatigue is to use something what she's calling clinical empathy. And let's talk about, let's, let's, I'll describe to you, or let her describe what clinical empathy is, and then we'll touch on this a little bit. Clinical empathy is, the key to practicing clinical empathy is to be engaged and curious about the life narrative of a, of a client, but not become lost in a sympathetic merger with a client. So you want that, you want that emotional connection, but you don't want emotional involvement. You've, you've got to be able to be able to empathize with what they're going through, gather information from them, talk to them, listen to them, become involved without becoming, uh, uh, as they say here, a, a sympathetic merger. It's the same as in any relationship, in this one in particular, but where you need to have boundaries. You need to yeah. understand what the boundaries are and, and how you effectively manage that. Now, in this environment where, where you're talking about nursing in particular, certainly that's gonna be a greater risk because as you point out, people get into this profession because they're naturally right, right. empathetic and they wanna help people and people that are, that are sick or hurting. So, there's a tendency to want to do that, but when you do that, the burnout many times follows and you start to shut down. And right. again, what Eva's saying. When, when, and what she's saying is actually to go the opposite direction, is in order to combat, uh, and I think she's suggesting here, even though they don't talk about it really in this particular article, is to kind of nip it at the bud, is to prevent uh, this kind of stress from occurring and, and to prevent job burnout from happening in a healthcare environment, is that they should be encouraging uh, what she calls clinical empathy, where rather than pull back, you should be practicing involvement with your patients. If you do that, your patient care is going to be better. You're actually going to avoid or, or help mitigate uh, job burnout and uh, raising the quality of health care and also in making yourself feel better about your job and, and avoiding this, this burnout situation. Sure, bu so. buffering yourself to a certain point from, from the exposure to it right. so that you understand going in the risk factor that this right. involves. Right, like it's, it's a balance. Yeah. It, it's a balance. You don't want to get, you don't wanna get over involved, but you, wanna, you don't want to pull yourself out of the e equation mm -hmm. uh, completely. And anybody, I, anybody who's been in a hospital have, have met nurses or, or other health care professionals where they have obviously pulled the plug. I mean, they're there, they're giving you the shots, they're taking your blood pressure, but as far as you as a human being being there, they checked out a they long time out. ago. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and then it happens, and we know why. I mean, Yeah, yeah, it's a stressful job. It's a stressful job, and not only that, but I mean, we've had a lot of, there's been layoffs, there's been more people who are still there, are working longer hours. Caseloads are going up, the number of patients they're seeing. And that's, the that's, census, that's, as you talked about. The census has is, is, is gone up in many hospitals. They're driving the census up in order to get the most bucks. Um, census, for those of you who don't work in there, is kind of, the number of people in the hospital. Right. And, and, and for nurses, the, the, as the number of people in the hospital or healthcare setting, whatever it is, increases, then the number of patients they have to see, but you have to keep up your quality of care. So, I mean, it's just a, it just gets a, to be a mess. Yeah. So it can be a very stressful position, yeah. so. Great, thanks, Herc. Well, a good, good human interest story there for Dirk. Thank you for that. Sure. Uh, I wanna talk about another interesting human interest story that we covered this week. Um, and the article was titled, 
eight B attitudes of holding people accountable. I, and I, I really like this one in particular because it, it's written from a, a, a new uh, con contributor of ours called named uh, Robert Whipple. Yep. Robert Whipple has never written for us before. And, and we, uh, we like bringing these fresh voices to you. So it's, it's always a, a, of interest to us to have sure. different perspectives. And, and Mr. Whipple had a, uh, Robert Whipple had an interesting uh, take on this, the idea of accountability. And, and he puts it in this framework of, of these eight, what he calls B attitudes. Uh, things that you need to be aware of, things that you need to be in order to be properly empathetic, as we talked about, sure. and also in order to give guidance and hold people accountable that are in your office. And let's take a quick look at these eight and we'll kind of run through what, what they were and, sure. and, and why he talked about them. The first be attitude, which, and these all, these all make sense, the first one is uh, be clear about your expectations. In other words, understand what you're saying and be clear about what it is that you want people to do so that you can properly hold them accountable. Be sure of your facts. He uses the example of where he at one point as a manager, he knew of a manager that kind of gave one of his assistants a little bit of grief for a job that wasn't done by that person, it was done by somebody else. So right. be sure about what you're doing. Be timely, give, give people that feedback right away. Don't wait a week and, and circle back on it later. Be kind, think about that other person's feelings. Even if you tend to be a very direct, forward person, lay back a little bit and think about what they need to. Yeah, they to, may not be as quite as direct. Don't be quite as direct. Yeah. Be consistent. Be consistent not only with individuals, but within that same person. In other words, treat Bob the same way you would treat Sally, but also treat Bob the same way during the course of the day and over the course of time. Yeah. Be discreet. If there's, a, if there's a comment that you need to make, if you need to correct someone's behavior, do it in private. Again, the, the, the golden rule generally in these cases is, is you know, critique in, in private, uh, praise, praise, praise in public. In public yeah, right. yeah, yeah. Be gracious, and this is, this is a really important one, the idea of, of being gra gracious where, you know, if, if, if somebody didn't do something right, um, you know, you want to you wanna try to be mindful of, of, of why that was and, and kind of help them, right? You don't want to sure. be too, too confrontational on it. And be balanced. Again, holding people accountable isn't only holding people accountable when they do something bad. That's what many people think about with accountability. But hold them accountable when they did something right as good as well, you know, and do it the same way. You know, if you're gonna, you know, if you're gonna lay out exactly why things were wrong when you're holding them accountable for a bad behavior, lay out and point out exactly what they did right. Here's why this was so helpful. Here's how it helped the organization. Here's why I'm happy you did that and why you should continue to do it. So yeah. do it in the same way. The other thing that I took out of this piece, which I think is really important, is this idea of accountability is a two-way street. And certainly managers need to hold employees accountable for the good of the organization. You need to understand that that you are holding them accountable so the organization can, can prosper, so that your bosses and the shareholders and the company itself can, can do better. But also, strangely, interestingly, you're also accountable as a manager to your employees. You need to help them grow in their position. You need to make right. sure that behaviors that they're doing that maybe aren't very good or, or are counter to the to the importance of the organization or what the organization holds valuable are excised. And they don't do that because, hey, they're not gonna grow. They're not gonna get better. They're not gonna grow in the organization or in their careers or they continue to model those bad behaviors. See, and, and I, I, would, um, uh, I would argue that the, the, the accountability, oops, lost the slide. Um, being, a, being accountable should probably be right at the very top of the, uh, uh, accountability should be at the top of the list. I mean, sure. everything starts with, we, we're all accountable to each other for the, the environment that we have and how we relate to each other and understanding of our job. And then from that, I think everything, if, if, I, if I'm going to hold you accountable, then I've got to be clear about what my expectations are for you and right. so Every, forth. Right. Everything's going to flow from there. Everything's going to flow from and there. It, yeah. And again, it's a two-way street. You, know, you, can't, you can't just hold somebody accountable and not understand that they have to hold you accountable as well. An organization is, is not a thing. It's a collection of people, and we talk about this a lot, it's a collection of people that have a common goal and you're all in it together. You can't just say as a manager, hey, that person's terrible, I'm gonna give that person a lot of abuse and eventually I'm gonna fire them. Right. I mean, it happens, unfortunately, sure. in many cases, yeah. but if you do it that way, you're never gonna basically help the organization grow in an organic way where improvement really happens and takes, takes root. So, Accountability is a really important concept for the overall quality of, of any organization, whether it's service or, or manufacturing. Well, what, what I like about these eight items is that this really, and, and we always circle back around to these type of management issues because in the end, uh, as it's been drilled into us 
time and again is at some point it all relates to the culture of the organization. The culture of the organization is pretty much driven by by management, upper level management, mid-level management, it, it, it trickles down. They have got to set the culture. When they set the culture, that affects, uh, whether it's a good culture or a bad culture, that affects the quality of the product or service, even a physical product, uh, physical quality. I mean, obviously you can understand service quality because that's human interaction, but I would argue that even uh, a good or a bad culture within an organization even affects if you're making a physical product because yep. if the workers don't care about what they're making because the culture is sucky, then it's gonna, they're not going to care as much about what they're doing making the physical product or even inspecting a physical product. It's like, ah, it's good enough, whatever. Right, you know? right. They're not going to grow. The company's not going to succeed. Yep. It's just, we talk about feedback loops. That's a negative feedback loop yep. that's very easy to propagate. So we want to try to avoid yep. that. Good story. Great, great, yes. And uh, a couple of good, actually a couple of very good human interest stories this week. Uh, so we're going to move from human interest stories, which we cover a lot, the, kind of what we call the softer side of quality. And we're going to move into this week's tech corner. Uh, this is a unique tech corner for us. It's the first time we're having a tech corner and our studio B. Now, what we've done and you've seen many times is that Dirk will, will do a, a tech corner and he'll have what we call our, our gauge cam and that'll be the camera that'll be kind of over the desk here and we'll look at a small piece of equipment. Well, this week's tech corner, we have a slightly different uh, piece of equipment that we're gonna be looking at. It is from QVI, it's their new Snap dimensional measuring machine and we're gonna throw it to Dirk now and have him look at it. Take it away, Dirk. Okay, thanks, Mike. Um, yes, well, we're in our uh, new setting here, Studio B, which is 2,000 centimeters, do the math, from Studio A. Um, and with me today is Chuck Marks. Chuck is the regional uh, manager for optical gauging products, OGP, and he's here to show us uh, a fairly new product from OGP called the, uh, the Snap. And the Snap is a Tell me what it is again? Digital measuring machine. See, I'm gonna call it a vision system, but he calls it a, a digital measuring machine, right. which is just a vision system, right? <laughs> <laughs> Pretty close, a lot of the same technologies. Okay, tell us what, about it. What the, D the digital measuring machine is, is a little bit different from a video machine in that we don't have any moving elements on this. So the stage doesn't move, the optics, uh, it's not a mechanical zoom, it's all a digital zoom. Okay. Um, we've done a couple uh, unique things with the, uh, the snap. Uh, one is we have a uh, large field of view, uh, about 78 millimeters. Uh, field of view. We also have a very deep depth of focus of, of about 38 millimeters. So you can have a, a fairly uh, thick part in here that you're able to measure an image. So the you can measure from the top of the part to the bottom of the part up to an inch and a half. Right, now it's, it's all, all in focus. Right, okay. it's all XY measurement on this, but okay. you're able to see any of those steps at, at the different heights. What, what we did is we have a telecentric zoom system in here. Um, we're very familiar with uh, telecentric optics on both our comparators and our video lines. Um, and so we've been able to take that technology that we've learned and apply it in a, uh, a large format measurement system. Um, very shop floor uh, ready. So, th so this might be, uh, th this in a sense is, is kind of a well, you probably wouldn't call it this, but an optical an optical comparator on steroids. It's it's a two it's a two D measurement system, but with with depth. Right, that's but, correct. Okay. Um, not only one of the pro uh, challenges with a uh, comparator is the ability to image the surface, and okay. uh, what we'll see here with some of the lighting uh, techniques is uh, you're able to look down inside parts, do measurements inside parts, which you really can't do sure. with a, a optical comparator. So I understand what, what we're going to do is we're going to show how easy it is to program a part, mm -hmm. and then and then show what it would be like for an operator to actually run a run a part once. once had been Once it's right? created. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Well, so what we're going to do here is we're going to start with just a fairly simple uh, stamp part, uh, 2D type uh, measurement, and it's very easy to do measurements. Um, the the second major feature of the uh, the snap is the Measure X uh, 2D software. Now we've been making uh, Measure X uh, 3D software for a number of years. The 2D is uh, simply an XY uh, measurement uh, software on that. Okay. So we can take a. Uh, so we can get a screenshot on this. Okay. Yeah. Great. So uh, if we want to do, for instance, just a line, we can just click and drag. And I don't have to be right on the edge. I just bring it up, and then the edge detection does all the work. As you know, with uh, you know, mechanical uh, instruments, yeah, you the two very, of us can measure them yeah, differently. Exactly. Right. Different, yeah. So what we can do here is we, can, uh, we let the, the system do the measurement for us. So as we begin to build a, uh, a little inspection, every time I make three clicks and see here it makes a circle, uh, gives us a diameter, and as soon as I say OK, that saves that, that particular step in the, run, okay. in the uh, program. In a picking up a radius? Yeah, sure. Pick up a radius. We just click it. Notice it'll say that uh, we're going to start with a uh, circle or an arc, uh, take the three points, and it'll go ahead and do the measurements. 
Now one of the benefits of this, now we talked there's not a uh, mechanical zoom, but there is a digital zoom. So if I have smaller features like maybe the straight lines on the top of this, uh, these slots over here, I can move up. Uh, we have an eight position uh, zoom, uh, digital okay. zoom built in. So, so you're, just zo you're just zooming into the part. That's correct. Okay. And I can drive around the stage. All right. Even though the stage isn't moving, uh, very similar to if you're familiar with using a video machine, sure. uh, you can drive around inside the the camera array essentially. And so we can begin uh, doing these, uh, uh, continuing our programs, measuring some lines, doing whatever widths and, and measurements we have to do. Uh, does this measure angles as well? Yep, I could construct a intersection between those two lines, get the okay. uh, the angle between them. Okay. Sure. Um, from here, I can go ahead and just run the program. I'm going to go ahead and run it here, and you'll see it's very, very quick. There's no moving uh, elements. So we took, uh, I think there's about, uh, I don't know, eight or nine uh, features in there, and it measured them in about three seconds. Okay. So it's much quicker than, um, you know, a, a standard video-based uh, system would sure. be, or a comparator, which uh, only takes, uh, you know, one data point and at the a time. It looked like the programming was, I mean, it looked like somebody could be taught to program this actually fairly quickly, it looks yeah, like. Yeah, typically okay. uh, one day of training for this type of uh, uh, system, video systems uh, with, with moving stages are typically about a two-day training okay. class. All right. yeah. Now one of the things uh, we've done to, to highlight um, is a, uh, you know, when we get into a little more prismatic parts, okay, we have a uh, adjustable uh, stage that can go up and down up to four inches. So if you have a part that's got some features on one end of it, you know, it's not very flat, we can drop the stage, we can raise the stage to uh, make sure we're able to, to bring those features in, in focus. Okay, now I noticed this part you put on there, just so people know, that part looks like maybe half an inch, 13 millimeters or so in, in, in yeah. height. Yeah, and so the, right. that, entire, that entire part will be in focus from top to bottom. That's correct, okay. that's correct. Um, one, some of the, uh, the features we have, the lighting, uh, you know, as you look on the screen here, you can see that uh, we have a backlight, so it looks very much like the comparator you, you uh, sure. mentioned. Uh, we also have a direct surface illumination. Uh, direct surface illumination lets us see down inside the part. Uh, looks pretty good, but we have another set of lighting that actually will really make the internal features uh, kind of kind of pop, and that's our ring light. So we bring in our uh, uh, ring light in here. We can control the different sections of it and the different angles as we bring these lights up. Get them all going here. And so here, what I've done is I've only turned on two sections of the light. As we rotate this around, Okay. Oh, You'll okay. see how the, sure. the image on the screen there changes. Now what happens there is when we look at a CAD model, the edges are always nice and square. And then we, as we know as, as manufacturers, that's not always the case when the part right. comes out of the mold or off the machine, there's going to be break edges. It's very important with a video system that we, we're not measuring the part, we're measuring the image of the part. So we have to present the most crisp image we can to the, uh, to the uh, Camera array to do the measurement. And so the I know on this on this ring light here. So you got eight segments. You can select which segments which segments you want on. Absolutely. Uh, and that gets programmed into the uh, gets set into the program right, as well. Right. Okay. That's all part of the uh, the, the method there. Now I notice uh, looks like the ring light. Uh, looking at the reflection here, looks like you got two different colors, red and green. That's correct. Uh, we have uh, what you can do is um, every other uh, section is a different color, so you can turn on all the green or all the red. Now that may come into play if you have different color plastics. Sometimes certain lights. Uh, better. We also did it for a lot of the circuit board, the PCB uh, sure. type uh, uh, applications. It also will illuminate the gold trace or, or maybe some of the wiring traces a little better depending on what color you okay. have. So you just pick which color you, pick which color you want. Uh, right. And you do that from the setting is here as well. That's okay. correct. All right. That's correct. So one of the things we really wanted to highlight uh, with the system is simply an, an ease of use uh, type environment. Um, so because you, you have very little uh, 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 experience on here, so we're going to take this uh, this part we have, and we're just going to put it on the stage, and we're going to show you how you can open a program and run it okay. without really having to know how to use uh, the software very much. So I'll let okay. even a uh, magazine editor <laughs> yeah, load the part even, on here. Even an editor, yeah, even an editor can do it. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so I just drop this. Uh, I just make sure it's what roughly in the roughly in the Ruff, center of the, the that's screen. That's correct. There? Roughly and in the center. Press this button. Well, let me go ahead and uh, and we're going to open the program now. What we've done for a lot of customers is we'll go ahead and we'll incorporate a uh, barcode scanner. And then you could walk up with your parts, you have your tray of parts, you have your traveler with it. Your traveler probably has a barcode okay. or an RFID or something like that. You're able to scan that, you're able to get it to open the program for you. And now on the front panel right here, we have a uh, run and an okay. OK button. So if you want to press the run button there, All right. and uh, so it came up, says so okay. you're ready, you go ahead right. and say okay. And now what the Oops. system's going to do, yeah, you got to mess it, press it down there a little bit. There we go. So the system went in 
and uh, it's going through and it's doing all these measurements and there's about 85 different individual steps that are being measured on this uh, okay. program and you can see the uh, the entire runtime was about 10 seconds okay so it's very fast because we don't have any moving elements now, I noticed on this slide is this actually a, a CAD model of the uh, of what we're right. measuring, or is this, or is this what's actually being measured? Right. This is a graphical representation of what we've measured. Okay. So, okay. so come now. You'll notice we do have the flyouts showing the different dimensions, the different okay. sizes. Uh, we can incorporate CAD. We can fit the data points over to uh, a CAD model okay. and do uh, you know GDNT uh, type uh, profiles and 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 true position and, and complex true position. Okay. And you would just export out of here into that's correct. Okay. Into, okay. That's correct. Okay. Yep. Great. Um, mm. So. Uh, Tell me again. This was this took about this. Ha how many steps did this have, or uh, how many features did we measure? Uh, this measured, I think, uh, eighty-one different in, uh, items. It took like ten about seconds. About ten seconds. Okay. Yeah. Uh, right. And you and I think you said in, th in this case we pulled we pulled the measurement routine down from a file. file You're open, saying it right. could be done with a RFID scanner or a barcode scanner. That's correct. Or whatever. That's correct. Bring it in. Okay. Yep. Uh, what's the accuracy? Uh, accuracy on this is at low mag, we're at 10 microns. At high mag, we're at uh, 5 microns accuracy. Okay. Yeah. Um, what about the market? I mean, who is this primarily intended for? You know, it's really, there's a uh, benefit of uh, QVI as a whole is we're really not uh, segmented into any one market. So we do a lot of work in the medical device industry. We do a lot of plastic injection molding, uh, government labs, um, you know, aerospace, military, all sorts of different uh, markets. So really what it's designed for is customers with, uh, you know, Fairly small parts, you know, under three inches, uh, with a lot of features in them that that can be seen in one pass and very quickly. Okay. Uh, now you you mentioned that the the depth of focus is uh, I think you said about thirty seven millimeters. Yep. yep. Okay. Uh, it's about an inch and a half. So yep. if if you had a larger part, mm -hmm. um, you could just focus. You could focus on whatever area of interest on that, as long as it fit within the volume of, of the machine. That's right? correct. And we have a uh, adjustable Z down here, so we could just raise or lower the the stage up and down until we get to uh, that area in focus. Okay. All right. Yep. Terrific. Um, yep. Where are these? Uh, where are these uh, available? Uh, where, actually, where are they made first? Okay. Uh, Quality Vision International um, is a, a recently ISO uh, uh, nine thousand one okay. certified company, and we're headquartered in Rochester, New York. Um, and you can uh, look for these systems uh, with any of the either the uh, RAM optical distributors as well as any of the optical gauging products uh, representatives. If you want to find out more information, I think there'll be a link on the uh, the flyby here. That uh, right, there is right. a actually there, there, I think there's a link on the screen. There's also a link uh, to the Snap product in particular right. uh, underneath our player at the very bottom. Mm -hmm. um, where are these manufactured? Uh, Rochester, New York. Oh, the Rochester? Right, okay. Yes, sir. Yep. Recommend all made in America. Okay. Yep. Okay. Um, well, Chuck. Thanks a lot for showing us the, the QVI Snap. Uh, if you have more questions on this product, um, you can email us questions. Actually, let me just make sure we didn't get any questions while this was coming in. Um, if you have any further questions on this, you can email them to us. We'll forward them on to Chuck, or you can go to the link at the bottom of the page there uh, underneath the player. The last link under the player is a link out to the Snap product. So, uh, Chuck, once again, thanks for joining right, us no here problem. at Tech Corner. <clears throat> Excuse me. Mike, uh, back to you. Thank you, Dirk, and uh, of course, thanks, Chuck, and thanks to the good people at QVI for allowing us to feature the snap on this special episode of uh, Tech Corner, uh, on that special segment of Tech Corner here on Quality Digest Live. Always interesting to, to, chat, with, uh, to chat about good products, good techniques, and, and ways to improve quality. And uh, Dirk, thank yes, you. I'm thank back. you for doing that. Yeah. That was, uh, that was fun. I say it was, it's, it's, it's kind of fun. We've always had, uh, this is the, the first time where we've been able to go out and, t and take a look at a larger product in Tech Corner. We've been looking at smaller pieces, but now we have a new set. Uh, it's possible to start bringing in larger, uh, larger items and looking at them, so, so it's a lot of fun. Any of you have, have products you want us to look at, big or small? Tell, them, well, tell us about it and, well, big, <laughs> small or yeah, kind of big. That big, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Bring them on the show. Well, I have one more thank you I want to want to offer here to today's sponsor. Very important thank you. The sponsor of today's show, of course, is Sparta Systems. For more than 15 years, Sparta's TrackWise software has enabled professionals to improve their processes and increase revenue. Please take a moment to visit www.spartasystems.com to learn more. We like sponsors. Yes, we do. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, keep your eyes open next week. Next Tuesday is the final special edition QDD uh, coming out, Quality Digest Daily. Uh, this one is on risk management. We've done uh, environmental and health. Yep. And now we're doing risk. Now we're doing risk. That's right. Uh, so that'll be Tuesday, uh, chock full of really interesting articles on risk management, which really, in case anybody hasn't been paying attention, is the big up-and-coming topic for quality professionals. Um, it's, it's kind of the next step. 
That's right. Uh, so you definitely want to read that and kind of come up to date. That's right. Uh, also, today is the last Quali Digest Live of the year. I know. It was a fast year. Shoo, man. <laughs> How many of these have we done? Over 30. <laughs> More than 30 episodes of Quality Digest Live. And they get better every time. Yes, they do. Yes, they, yes, do. they do. Oh, we think we do. We think, we think so, at least. So, uh, yes, yeah, so that's our last episode of, of QDL. We're not going to have a QDL next week. We won't have one on the 30th. Uh, next week, as a matter of fact, is our last week of QDD as well. We're, sure. we're running uh, the special on Tuesday. Uh, we're running QDD Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Then we're taking off on Friday. And then we're off all next week. Beginning so of the year. Yep. we won't see you again until January of, uh, of 2012. That's right. And we'll be back on January 2nd with QDD. And we'll be back on January 6th with the first episode of QDL of the year. But before we go. Before we go, we wanna, of course, wish all of you a great holiday, uh, very, very happy new year, safe, healthy, happy new year. So from, again, from all of us. Yes, all of all us. us. <laughs> all of us. The crew. The crew, the, the people that make, make what we do so, <laughs> so feasible, so possible. From all of us to all of you. Please have and a great year. And even that guy in the back there. <laughs> That's all right. All so, yeah, we all uh, wish you, hey, Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Yay. Happy New Year. So long. We'll see you.